Coach Richard Williams. For some reason, he has stayed your friend all these years. I have no well, idea why. But uh, Richard, I, Richard and I have a lot of the same thoughts about basketball and basketball coaching. We don't express them publicly, but we, <laughs> but we do. And um, I guess our fans remember that uh, he took his basketball team to Lexington, Kentucky, beat Connecticut. Who else you beat up there besides, Lake, besides Connecticut? Cincinnati. Connecticut Cincinnati and Cincinnati. Now to go to the Final Four. Uh, I was at Alabama, unfortunately, when Babe McCarthy was there. And I, so I know all the basketball coaches that have been, that's been in, at Mississippi State. There's been some good ones, but there hadn't been one any better than Richard. We, Richard's a very good basketball coach, knows the game backwards and forwards. And, um, you know, I, he just he's just a good friend. So I can recall one time when it was snowing real bad in Starkville. <laughs> and I took my team over there, and I think I, we got beat. And um, Richard gets on to me for this day. So what did I say on the after-game show, Richard, on that snowstorm? Well, the, the deal was you brought your team in early because you had a good team, and our team wasn't great. I was the assistant coach at that time, by the way. Bob Boyd was the head coach. Okay. And, and it, it, it was snowing, and you brought your team in early because you didn't want the game to be canceled. Because <laughs> you knew you had an easy win, and, and Mississippi State ended up winning the game. But because right. it snowed so hard, uh, we let the, the administration side let everybody in free, all the students in free. We win the game, and Wimp is quoted the next day, Barry, <laughs> in the paper as saying they opened the doors and let all the riffraff in. <laughs> well, I think yeah. I said that on the oh. after-game show. <laughs> <laughs> you might have. Probably did. Good, good, the thing, there wasn't, the good thing there wasn't Twitter back then. Or they would have told him what they thought about his comment as well. No kidding. The riff no raft. Kidding. They'd have uh, killed him. They'd have roasted him. Richard, this is, uh, these two teams are a little bit alike. I think Alabama's a little bit better at the wings and, and at the post position. But they're both three and three. They're both of them about, about the same record. Um, without giving anything away, Um uh, Talk about this team as best you can, and what you think. Well, uh, I think you're exactly right when you, you say that Alabama's a little better in the post position because, you know, Dante Hall will get the ball. They'll throw it to him, and sometimes it's on screen and rolls, and, he, you know, he's so long, and they just throw it up there, and he'll grab it and dunk it. And uh, Mississippi State is, is, without question, a perimeter-oriented team. Uh, they have three perimeter players that are really good in the starting lineup. Tyson Carter comes off the bench. He could start for a lot of teams in the league. Uh, and then Robert Woodard comes off the bench. Uh, he's a, a, a guy that was the player of the year in Mississippi last year, 6'7", 230. And he'll also play some four. But uh, Mississippi State doesn't throw the ball to the post a lot. Uh, it's more of a perimeter-oriented offense. They shoot a lot of three-point shots. Uh, in the Auburn game, uh, Last Saturday, for instance, when I, I don't know if you looked at those stats, Mississippi State in that game took 22 three-point shots in the first half alone, 22 in the first half, and they were making a bunch of them. They have, uh, right now we have one, two, three, four, five guys shooting 35% or better from the three-point line, and that's, that's with a lot of shots. So uh, their, their game depends on three-point shots. The thing that concerns me about that, can you take that on the road with shooting three-point yeah. shots at home in front of your home crowd and in your own goals you practice on every day, that's one thing. But doing that on the road, that's another thing. And that's when sometimes I think you really need some sort of, of uh, inside attack. Now, uh, the Bulldogs will score a lot of points in the paint, but it's because all three of their perimeter players are such good drivers. They can turn the corner and get to the rim and finish at the rim. Uh, yeah, right. Mississippi State's got four guys averaging double figure, led by Witherspoon, 17 a game. Peters getting 13. Holman, 11. Uh, Nick Witherspoon getting 10. Carter's right at double figures, 9.7. So they have, uh, Coach, a pretty balanced scoring attack. It's not like you can go in there and just try to take out one guy. There's plenty of guys can score score the basketball. Is that right? Yeah, it makes it difficult to scout, I would think, because, as you say, Barry, they, they, they have a lot of guys that can score. But I do think that at the top of all scouting reports is Quindary Weatherspoon. Uh, I think there are two things. If, if you're scouting Mississippi State, number one, you try you say to your team, try to keep Lamar Peters out of the paint. Well, good luck with that because he is he is so quick with the ball. Uh, he's strong. Uh, he can go left or right. He's a left-hander. Obviously, he prefers left. He can go left or right. And he does things off the dribble that I've not seen anybody do in a long time. I mean, he just has... 
dribbling skills that, that not many people have. So I would think uh, the scouting report says keep him out of the paint. Uh, again, that's very difficult to do. It's easy to tell your player that's difficult to do. The other thing, Quindary Weatherspoon, he's an excellent three-point shooter, but he is one of the best drivers and finishers at the rim uh, that we've had here in a long, long time. And this year, he even has developed some sort of mid-range jump shot uh, game. He's not done that in the past. In the past, it's been either three-point shots or drives to the basket. Uh, now he, he has a mid-range game, so he's a very difficult matchup. Uh, Tom, uh, if you look at if, if you look at it from a defensive standpoint, Richard, I would think Alabama will have a little bit of a difficult time trying to defend the dribbler. Uh, Mississippi State takes it to the glass pretty well, but I also think Mississippi State will have a little bit of, of a problem defending Alabama's size. Is that is that right? Well, Mississippi State has some size now. Abdullah Dew, the starting center, 6'11", 255, and he's one of the best defensive centers uh, that I've been around in a long time. And he can really move his feet. And actually, in the Auburn game, well, they had him switching off on Auburn perimeter players. That's how, that's how good he is getting down his stance and moving his feet. Uh, he, he's a, a, a shot block. He will block shots. He's not a great shot blocker, but, but he's, he is big and long and very strong. And then Eric Coleman, now, he's, he's about 6'10". Uh, but he's thin. Now, he's not going to overpower anybody with his physicality. But he is an excellent help side shot blocker. He, he is not necessarily the guy he's guarding, but he'll come off his man and block shots at the rim. Has excellent timing, uh, long arms, and so he, he's a factor in there. And then they bring a five-star McDonald's All-American off the bench, Reggie Perry, who you yeah. probably remember his dad that played at Mississippi State many years ago, Al Perry. Sure, uh, I do. Reggie's Reggie's six ten, two forty. <clears throat> very, very talented. Uh, good rebounder, just an excellent rebounder. Hasn't found his shot yet. He's, he's like most young guys; he won't shoot it too much from deep in the perimeter. But uh, he he has a game too. So there is some size there. Uh, talk about Ben Howland a little bit. You know, all, everybody always knew he's a great coach. Did a great job at Pittsburgh. A great job at UCLA. Uh, but when I saw he was coming to Mississippi State, I'm like, wow, is it, you know, he's guys been living in LA. He's going to come to Starkville, Mississippi. Uh, what's there, wrong with that? Well, it's just a big <laughs> difference between <laughs> LA and I'm not talking about lower <laughs> Alabama. Uh, but he seems to really, uh, the interviews that he seems to really be at peace. Uh, they, I think maybe enjoy the, slower pace of life and he's recruited really well uh just talk about what ben Hallen, what he's done there and were you surprised not that they hired him but just this big difference coming from la uh to start well Vegas. He, he, he actually lives in santa barbara and, and he lives his house i think is on the beach he's, he's described it to me uh so it must be just a beautiful place there on the beach in santa barbara uh, but he has fit into Starville, and his wife, Kim, has really fit into it here. Uh, they, they've they uh, bought a house uh, out, in, not in the country, but kind of out of town a little bit. Uh, bought a couple of acres there. Uh, but Ben, is, he's been great to me. You know, I, I've been on the radio broadcast crew since he's been here, and he involves me with all kind of stuff. I hang out with the team. I uh, go to practices. Uh, so he, he really, he, he's, he's embraced Starkville and Starkville has embraced him. And, and, you know, I think he's really enjoying it here. But I think more than anything else, Barry, he's enjoying being back in coaching. He yeah. is a coach. That's what he is. And he loves to teach basketball. He watches film or tape, whatever they do now on these uh, uh, computers, and watches it incessantly. As soon as we get on the bus uh, after a game and on the airplane coming home, he has the game tape on, and he's breaking it down. Uh, he knows everything about the opponents. Uh, so he, he just watches game film all the time. And he's an excellent teacher, uh, especially defense. Uh, they, this team spends more time working on defense than any team I've ever been around. And they're <laughs> going to go over everything that the opponent does. Uh, it, it may be 15 different sets. It may be 20 different sets. But they're going to cover all of those sets the two days before game. So uh, it, it's not a problem or it's not a, an issue of Mississippi State being prepared for their opponents. They don't always play well. They don't always shoot it well, but they are always prepared for the opponent. Uh, the league, Richard, uh, Tennessee is, is I think, mentally and physically bet the best. Uh, I think LSU is a little bit wild, but also very talented. And I think Auburn is way, way underachieved. Uh, maybe that's what the three-point shot does to you. 
maybe it, sometimes you're going to underachieve more than then you're going to go the other way. Uh, the two teams that you and I will be seeing tomorrow night are, you know, kind of close to even, I guess, score wise. Talk about the league and and your assessments of uh, they keep talking about eight in the NCAA. I don't believe that. I think I think the top number would be six, but I may be wrong. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I tend to agree with you. I was thinking about that uh, this morning. Uh, you know, that it, it it depends on how the season plays out and, you know, how these conference tournaments go and all that stuff. Wimp, it could be eight. I don't think so. Uh, right now, I think Tennessee's the best team in the league. Uh, I, I love watching them play. I love the way they play. Uh, I love the way Rick Barnes coaches his team. Uh, he's not afraid to coach them. He's not afraid to take them out uh, when they do something that they've been coached not to do. Uh, and I see so many coaches in today's game that are, they're, they're afraid to hold their players accountable uh, for yeah. the mistakes they make. And I don't see that with Rick Barnes at all. So I love the way he coaches his team, the way they share the ball. I don't think they're the most talented team in the league. Now, obviously, they're, they're good and they have good players. Uh, I think Kentucky is really playing well right now, though. Uh, I mean, and they're talented. Uh, but as usual, they have so many freshmen, it took them a while to get it figured out. And and losing the point guard, I think they have Quade Green, I think was his name, it seems to have uh, shortened their rotation to the point where now this Hagens is the point guard. He's not having to worry about the other. And this, and he is really, really good. I mean, really good. And so I think Kentucky is, is they're playing really well. I agree with you about LSU. I have not seen them in person. Uh, we'll see them next week. I've watched them on TV. They are long. They are athletic. Uh, but they can take some shots that in my Mine are a little bit questionable, as, as many teams do uh, these days. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Ole Miss is playing better than anybody expected. And, and again, Kermit Davis Jr., uh, who's a friend of mine, and, and he, I think he coaches the heck out of his team. Uh, he, he's kind of an old-school coach, and he's going to hold those guys accountable. But I, I think they've kind of surprised some people. But it, I, I think as the season goes on, it's going to be tough for them because their inside game is not very good. Uh, no. They play hard, but they just don't have much of, of, of an inside game at all. It's all perimeter play. Uh, yeah. I think the league is good uh, from top to bottom. I'm not sure it's quite as good as it was last year. Uh, it, it just remains to be seen, but I kind of agree with you, Wimp, on that. I'm not sure we'll get eight teams in. Uh, Rich, you got an up-close uh, look at Auburn. Uh, obviously, Saturday night I watched that entire game. It, it was a, a good basketball game. Obviously, Auburn... Uh, I think they miss Wiley uh, defensively, probably is more than offensively. But just talk about Auburn because uh, that's be Alabama's next opponent. And what you saw when you saw them in person? Well, they can score. Uh, I mean, they can really score, and they're athletic. Uh, they get the ball down the floor very, very fast. Now, when you even when you score, you better be getting back uh, because they're coming at you, and they and, and they have a lot of guys that can score. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, Wiley, I, I thought about that. Now, I guess they miss him defensively because of his size. But the way they play on offense, I'm not sure he fits into that philosophy the way they play on no. offense because they take a lot of shots. The thing that Mississippi State did to limit their three-point shots, they switched everything. Uh, they never wanted anybody to come off a screen open. They never wanted anybody to come off down screens away from the ball open. Uh, they switched everything. And, and – uh, uh, Bryce Brown, who I think averages like 10 three-point shots a game, he got four three-point shots the entire game. Uh, and, and, and 73% of his field goal attempts are three-point shots. And, and they really limited him. Even though he scored, he, he didn't get three-point shots. So you, you have to be aware of everybody they put on the floor. And it's not, you know, Mississippi State gave up, I think, 82 points to Auburn, and they were trying to guard. It's not like they weren't guarding. Uh, Auburn is that good on offense. So, you have to put some points up to beat Auburn because they're going to shoot it. Now, if they're not making shots, that's different. It's kind of like Mississippi State's team. If, if we're not making three-point shots, uh, we're, we're not a very good basketball team because we rely on that so much. Yeah, but if you're a coach getting ready for Auburn, they got to scare you to death because you're just afraid that the, <laughs> it's going to be their, it's going to be their night shooting the basketball. And then especially going down there because uh, they, they play on such emotion – uh, they got to scare you, I would think, to death if you were getting ready for them. There's no question about it. Uh, they do because they can score at all five positions. And Jared Harper, the little point guard, I mean, he has he has such range on his jump shot. He'll be out there just kind of bouncing the ball, looking defender dead in the eye from 22, 23 feet, and all of a sudden he's up shooting it, and he can make it. 
uh, and then he's quick enough to get by you. And he'll turn it over. I think he had five or six turnovers against Mississippi State, and that really hurt Auburn. Mississippi State, Barry, actually took more shots that game than Auburn. I think State had 61 field goal attempts to Auburn's 49. That's because Auburn turned the ball over a lot. Uh, State caused them a lot of issues uh, with turnovers and converted those turnovers. But not only can Auburn score, they block shots because of their athleticism. Michael Moore and those guys, I mean, you've got to be aware of those guys around the basket because they have such tremendous jumping ability. Uh, but offensively, they are a scary bunch because they just come at you so fast and so hard, and they're going to shoot it anytime and from anywhere. Richard, we are we're in a game of, of threes and layups with not many twos taken, or let's just put back or a few jump shots. Uh, we're in a freedom of movement deal, um, and I really think it's up. To, it, it, the freedom of movement is, and I've talked with Mark about it, and I, I guess it's okay. But it all goes back to the individual officials. Um, I put out a, a, a thought this morning about the number of free throws, and I won't tell you what it is because I'm make, making our listeners call in. The number of free throws <laughs> that, the, that, the, that the home team shot in the 10 games, in the 10 basketball games uh, Saturday, the, the, how many more they, the home team shot than the visitors. And uh, – we we have we have some officials, and I'm not I'm not here to knock officials, but I it, we there are some where you you know you saw a game go and the, and the total number of free throws shot by both teams was six, and then you see some games where it was it's ridiculous. It is it, can we can we eliminate can we can eliminate the the calling of the of the fouls when the guy's not taking the ball to the basket. Uh, and not worry about freedom of movement there, would we be better off doing it that way? Well, for me, yes. <laughs> That's the way I like to play. Uh, and I think your teams are a lot that way, Wimp. Uh, big, strong, physical basketball teams that, uh, you know, if somebody came in the lane, we were going to make contact with them. Uh, yeah. And we didn't, want anybody to, we didn't want anybody to cut from one side of that lane to the other. We, we were going to bump when they cut, and we're going to try to, things like that. But uh, it, it, they don't let you do that much now, this freedom of movement thing. Uh, but, you know, Mississippi State doesn't shoot a lot of free throws compared to the other teams because they don't throw the ball inside very much. They, their guards shoot a lot yeah. of free throws. But they, actually, Quindary Weatherspoon leads the team in, in free throw attempts. He has 97, I think, free throw attempts for the year. And then the next most for any player on Mississippi State's team is 44. That's it. So, yeah. see, they don't, they don't get fouled a lot. Now, some teams do. The call that bothers me as much as any of them, Two things about the officiating really bother me. This this uh, verticality thing when you drive the ball to the basket and the guy, a big guy, jumps up and just hammers you. But as long as his arms are straight up in the air, that's not a foul. That that one bothers me. The other thing that bothers me about officiating now is how long it takes them when they go to that monitor. Oh yeah. Two of them go to the monitor and they look at the play and they look and they talk and if one of them walks away, then the third one has to go to the monitor. And then those two talk, they look, they talk. It drives me crazy. That, that if you're gonna, and, and I think you have to get the calls right. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm not against replay, uh, just totally against it. But I think there should be a time limit. When you go there, because we get replay sometimes. You can see the replay on the screen. It, it, sometimes it's so obvious. That's the call. Make the call and get the game going again. It just breaks up the flow of the game so many times. That, that, that just, that's what bothers me more than anything else about officiating right now, is that going to the monitor and taking so long to make a call. Yeah, you're right. Richard, uh, we're talking to Richard Williams. Uh, Dad's doing the radio tomorrow. Uh, you got, he told he, me that. You got any advice for him? You're a, ve- redder, uh, a veteran on the radio. You got any <laughs> advice for He's got a face well, for radio. We do know that. We, so. we both have radio faces. I've been told that several times. But <laughs> the thing that I find, and in all seriousness, is different about doing TV, which I, I've done some and Wimp's done some, and doing radio. As an analyst in TV, you get to talk a lot uh, because the, the play-by-play guys are not having to paint the picture. People see the picture on the, on the TV screen. The radio analyst, you don't get to talk much because the play-by-play guy is having to paint the picture for the fans. Good. So as a radio, radio analyst, when you get ready to make a point, you have to make it very quickly uh, because that, that play-by-play guy has to pick the action up uh, when the ball gets back in play. Most of the time at mid-court line, but if it's against a pressing team where the action's in line to in line, 
And sometimes the analysts on radio, you just have to sit there and kind of enjoy the game. <laughs> now, let me break that down for what he, what, what he just said. God gave you two ears and one mouth. So listen twice as much as you talk tomorrow night. That's what that's what he just told you. <laughs> Is that possible? I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that, Barry. I didn't say that. <laughs> hey, well, you've been his friend for all these years, so and put up with him. Have you ever seen a guy like free stuff more than him, Richard? Oh, come Never on. in my life. Unbelievable. Never in my it? life. But but now Barry, my wife and I went to Gulf Shores again last summer, spent a day with your mom and dad. He took us to lunch again and bought lunch again. Wow! Yeah. Two, ti- two times in a row. He's done yeah. that. It, it must have been. It must have been somebody we were doing a radio ad for. I don't no, think he was, actually I don't was, think was. It could have been. It could have been. Yeah. But it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, Coach, no, you awesome. guys coming over we today? Been a good friend for a long time. I appreciate his friendship. Are you guys traveling over today? Or are you going to wait tomorrow? Till tomorrow? I I haven't received the itinerary yet, <laughs> but I'm assuming we'll come over after practice uh, this evening. They don't. Run the itinerary by you, Coach. They don't. No, they, they don't. don't. They don't. They just tell you when to be there. All right. They gonna tell be me what time to be on y'all the bus. Y'all right. won't get home till Saturday. Yes, they're gonna let all the. <laughs> hey, it's gonna snow over here, and they're gonna let all the riffraff in. Just tell Ben yeah, Howland that. All the riffraff <laughs> will be in there. Won't bother me at all. Not at all. all right. I'm, See I'm you. Thank you, you, Richard. Great stuff, Coach. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.